Hello and welcome to the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. Uh, we are here today as part of the Mercedes-Benz Club, but we're going to bring you some 427 coverage as well. Don't tell the Mercedes Club. And it's not just going to be, a, oh, we're at this show here. We've got an extra special 427 surprise coming at the end, which is really what you guys want to see. But we're going to show you our favourite picks of the show that we've seen so far, and then we'll get to what we decided to buy when we're here. Yes. And realistically, what better place to start than with the car that we are literally named after, the 427 Cobra, which is where we got our name, 427 Motorsports, from. Uh, so if you don't know the story of the Shelby Cobra, check out one of our other videos about where our name came from, or you can watch the Donut Media video about Shelby. But finally getting to see a Shelby Cobra in person is it's a surreal experience. Now, this one is right-hand drive, which means it's realistically actually an AC, not a Shelby at all. But, I mean, it looks the same, so... Good enough. But the coolest Cobra here is not this one, but a very, very special one over here. This right here is the Shelby Cobra Daytona Coupe. Now this was created by Shelby and Dan Brock, I think it was, pretty sure. We didn't do any research as usual. But the Cobras weren't getting enough speed on the Maltan straight at Le Mans compared to the Ferrari 250 GTOs of the day. So Mr. Brock or Gurney, one or the other, put the sloped roof on it with the flat edged back and it managed to gain them close to something like 20 or 30 miles per hour on the straights, meaning they were flying past the Ferraris without making a bigger engine. This is still only a 289 engine, the smaller variant of the Cobras compared to the 427 and it was still wiping out Ferraris. So yes, whilst we may be Mercedes men, realistically we're Jag men at heart and the Jaguar display this year has been absolutely phenomenal. So over here on my right we have an XJS V12 which I suppose you all know my story with that. I've been trying to get one for bloody years and it hasn't happened yet. And there's one around the corner from us and now I've bought something else so I can't afford it, but whatever. This is the facelift model, which I think personally looks yeah. But we're not say that out loud so the owner doesn't get offended. And a lovely ruby red. Uh, it's still a gorgeous machine and seeing one in person for the first time in a long time is something special. But it's nowhere near as special as what we have coming up here. Over here on the right, we have a swallow. Say nothing. Keep your jokes to yourself. Swallow before they were Jaguar, basically. a uh, Swallow sidecars. They began making motorbike sidecars after World War II. And, uh, or was it before World War II? A war happened, and uh, then they changed their name to one of their models, which was the uh, Swallow SS Jaguar, and then it became Jaguar. You can actually see the earliest version of the Leaper here on the bonnet. Uh, it had a wee board on it rather than a big cat, because obviously, you know, they wouldn't have had a cat. But it's cool to see the evolution of where it all started. One of the other cool little things about it is you can actually see where you would have put your crank for the starting handle. And it's like a big half inch socket, basically, and you would put your spanner on if you wanted to lose your wrist, or your starter handle here, and you would crank it like rum, and then it would start. But next to us here is something really, really cool. This is the Jaguar XJ12 Broad Speed Race Car. It didn't do a lot, I'll be honest, it kind of broke down a lot, so it didn't really do very much and didn't win very much, but isn't it cool looking? So it was based on the Series 2 XJ12. It was a push by British Leyland to try and push the name out there and, you know, get back to Jaguar's motorsport heritage. Didn't work, but it looks cool. <laughs> it's based on the XJC, which is why it's only a two-door. But next to it is possibly one of the holiest of holy grails of Jaguar's. This is the XJ220, but it's not it's no average XJ220. This is one of the prototype XJ220s. And instead of having the mini Metro V6 shoved into it, this is the real deal with a V12. So th this one doesn't have the four wheel drive system that the original prototype XJ220 had. This one's only rear wheel drive, but a V12 rear wheel drive supercar, like that's, that's amazing. One of the key differences, other than the fact that, you know, it's got a V12 in it, is the headlights. So the factory production XJ220s would have had a color-coded lid over the headlights and instead of popping up, they would pop down. 
But on the prototype, this is a plexiglass cover over the top, and you can see it has the indentation for the headlight covers, but they're not actually there. Whether this would have been a weight-saving measure or what, I don't know. But in the race car XJ220s, they kept this set up, so... But yeah, very, very cool. Uh, so Pima here, we have one of my favourite cars personally. Uh, I really have a soft spot for big old Citroëns, and um, this was actually... In the 1970s, you might know that Citroen and Maserati were one company. One of them bought the other, and I think you can guess which one bought which. Uh, and what they wanted to do was build a Grand Tourer that would be as comfortable as a Citroen. So what you ended up with was the SM. And some people think it, the M stands for Maserati, but I don't think that's the case. This car was powered by a V6 engine. Uh, later cars were fuel injected, and it had Citroen's uh, hydropneumatic suspension system from the DS. And I think it's just stunning. I think it's fantastic. It's here in like a rally, guys, and I think it works really, really well, except for Michelin Man, who I hate. First. <laughs> <laughs> so once again with the big Citroens, we've got an XM Safari here, which is the estate version, which is in a guise as a BBC camera car. And I know these were used quite a lot, as well as the... The CXs before them were, were very popular camera cars, especially for horse racing. You used to see them along, alongside the horse racing tracks, uh, getting very, very still footage of races. And this is very cool. And it's a, it's a turbo diesel, I think. It's a turbo, it's turbo D badge to XM. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> At the risk of this being an entirely Citroen video, another of my favorite cars is here. Uh, this time the Traction Avant, which was a pre-war car from Citroen. And it was the first front wheel drive production car. Uh, and these, they're just, I don't know, they're an iconic design. They're just, I think they're just fantastic. So this is what's known as the Tom Wet Dream Stand. Um, it's the XJS Owners Club, which someday maybe I'll be a part of. This one here is the Trans Am XJS, and it's just so fat with a PH. Uh, they took this racing in America because they really wanted the XJS to be big in America, kind of like big in Japan, but not quite. Um, big, dirty side pipes, V12 engine. It's basically the production car, but fat with a roll cage stripped out that's just so cool unfortunately what they don't have here is this which is really really pixelated <laughs> it's, the, it's the yeah it's the one i've always wanted to see in person i love that car a bit that is the twr xjs which won at bathurst in 1985 it's just a big pile of xjs it, it reminds me of my dad's yard when i was younger except these ones are all shiny and work and run and are loved and weren't scrapped for not very much money. Sorry, I needed a minute there. Uh, so over here we have the HE, which would be a V12, which is what I'm trying to buy. Uh, not this exact one, <laughs> but because I couldn't afford that, Jesus Christ. Next to it here is an XJRS, which was actually made to commemorate how successful that green one was at racing. TWR took them and put a big spoiler on them, bored it out from 5.3 to 6 liter. I think it's the later V12, actually and stiffened suspension, put a racy wheel in it, and just made it a very, very nice car to drive. Over here we have a facelift one, which doesn't matter, so let's not talk about it. Over here we have a convertible one, which also doesn't matter, so bye. So here's a car we've got to at least mention in passing, the Saab 900 Turbo. Now, you, viewers of our channel will know that uh, my friend Joe has one of these, and uh, I think this one's really, really nice. Not that Joe's isn't. I just really like those three-spoke wheels. Uh, there's not a lot to say about this car that hasn't already been said, but very, very cool. Here we have another favorite of mine, the Volvo Amazon, or 131. This was uh, the precursor to the 140, which is a precursor to the 240, which is everybody's favorite car, as we know. Uh, it's beautiful in like a forest green color here, and complemented very nice by a P1800, aka Roger Moore's car in that show nobody watched. <laughs> so here we have my girlfriend's favorite car, the uh, BMW E9, I believe the chassis code for this one is. Now, this is a coupe version of their E3 saloon, which was uh, out in the 1960s, which wasn't really a rival to the S-Class, but kind of was. Uh, these, these CSL stands for Coupe Sports Light, and these were a lightweight version of the CS, uh, developed for motor racing. You could, uh, there was also a Batmobile version, which has loads of weird spoilers and stuff, and I think Adam West drove one. So over here, next door to our Mercedes-Benz stand uh, is teasing me greatly because it's my childhood dream car over the Shelby Cobra, is the Dodge Viper GTS. I was fortunate enough to have the owner let me sit in it and pretend I was playing the racing game. <laughs> so it's got a GT2 body kit on it, 
or GTSR, but I get either or. And the owner takes it on track days and everything and doesn't care how much it would cost to replace the panels because he loves it that much, he'll do it anyway, which is definitely the way to do it. He's done it up in the Team Oracle livery from Le Mans 99, I think. And obviously it's the one that was in Gran Turismo 3, 4, 5 and 6 and potentially 7. But either way, it is a proper childhood car. And to me, to see one of these in the flesh is absolutely mind-blowing. So for a lot of people, that's probably the end of their NEC experience. But for me and Connor, really ours is just starting because we find ourselves here early on a Monday morning at Rugby Train Station. Here we go. Because of course, we weren't just here to present the show at the NEC. Oh no, it wouldn't be us without managing to take something home with us. And after a spur of the moment decision, the same week as we were due to go to the show, Ryan Doyle decided to send me a link to an Almondine Red Mercedes 124 estate. Exactly what I have been looking for for a very, very long time. Bought sight unseen, we went, bought, conquered, drove, got home, and here's the story. Right, so we're stopped at a random services here in England somewhere. We haven't quite hit Wales yet, have we? No, this is Keel North Services. Yeah, what he said. So we're here. Um, it's our second stop. The first one was because we thought there'd be a better selection of food, but there wasn't, so then we came to this one. Uh, first impressions, we've done 75 miles so far. Um, I'm absolutely enamoured with it. I love it to bits. There are some issues. Uh, there's a bit of diff wind between 60 and 65. Um, the fluids in the gearbox and the diff haven't been changed, so I'm gonna change them when I get home. Because at the end of the day, there's 282,000 miles on this. There's a strong chance, God knows when those were last changed. It could be 200,000 miles ago, who knows. So I'll give them a change just to be sure. I know the oil has been changed. The previous guys who got it from did change the oil, so that's that's something, but gearbox and diff oil, they haven't. Um, is there anything else? Uh, the window regulator on the passenger side isn't working. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Same on all of them. No biggie. Um, SLS deleted. Yeah, we found that the, the self-leveling suspension in the back has been deleted, and it's got way too stiff shocks, so she's a bit of a bouncy lady. Um, but again, that's just a case of changing the shocks to softer ones and then you're sorted. The the gist of everything there that was absolutely perfect. The oil pressure is spot on, the temperature is perfect. The fuel gauge, um, as we'll show you a still image of, I put 99 pounds on it. I've never put that much fuel into anything in my life. That is genuinely about two or three months of driving out of my Golf. <laughs> so that was a bit of a, uh, but it didn't show above half full. So whenever we first got it, there was a quarter in it, so I know it goes below half full, but it doesn't seem to go above it. Now that could just be a case of cleaning the sender out and hoping that it works. But as long as I see after a good while of it going below half a tank, then I know at least when I'm gonna run out and just assume anything over that's a bonus. But we'll probably drain the tank and check the strainer and the level sender and stuff like that, just to make sure everything's okay. I plan on driving this all day, every day. So I want it all to be right. So for once, I'm actually gonna do a car properly. But also when you've waited this long to get a car in the spec and color and everything that you want, it's worth looking after it. So we're 75 miles in. There's another probably about 200 to go till we're home. Mm. So onwards and upwards, I guess. And hopefully we get there uneventful. Designed to be the car to end all cars. It was 
over engineered to perfection as everybody says with the 124s but when you drive one you realise it really is true. They, they kind of, they just mesmerise you when you drive it no matter what you were driving beforehand you'll get into a 124 and drive it and think Jesus this is nice and you don't actually realise that this is a 32 year old car when you think about it. I've got some cold up now so I'll just put that down and move away a bit and see what happens. Not very much happened. <laughs> Okay, it's a, it's a 300D with no turbo. They didn't do a turbo on the right hand drive one two fours. Full stop. One with a turbo, you have to buy a left hand drive one except for that. There's that death wang back in the middle you're hearing. But if I bring the throttle up a little bit. Goes away. Um, yeah, so it's a 300 d it's no M603, not a 606, and everybody says how ridiculously slow they are, and yeah, if you're coming out of a modern turbo diesel, then yeah, this thing is really, really slow, but it's not slow to the point where you can't keep up the traffic. It's not slow to the point where you constantly have people up your arse. Like, if you want to put the foot down, it may go out, but she will boogie eventually. Like, this thing will set at 75 miles per hour all day long without breaking a sweat. Just a point right now. But I don't believe what everybody says about them being one driver. Well, there's a venue in Virginia, Larry, from County Cavan. What are you doing in Wales? Why, yes. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's nowhere near as slow as people let on the are. Uh, it's, it's dead as hell from the start. That like Karuda Junction. Don't even think about pulling out in front of somebody because you're asking for trouble. But as, as a motorway cruiser, which really is what I wanted for, it is absolutely perfect. So don't believe everything they say. So we're And now, roughly two weeks later, roughly a thousand miles later, and no issues whatsoever later, back on our shores, here we are. Meet Tina. The STT124? Either or, whichever you prefer. The W124 State 300D. So, let's talk about her a bit. Tina is a 300D, that means a three liter straight diesel, non-turbo. They did not make a right hand drive turbo diesel 124. I don't know how many times I have had to say that to people the last month or two. They didn't do it, stop asking us. <laughs> anyway, it's an OM603, which is the predecessor to the OM606, which is the engine that everybody knows and loves dearly. Oh, and, and once. <laughs> but as slow as it may be, it's a lovely, dependable, soft cruiser. And I don't think I would swap her for anything else, being totally honest, even a Jag. <laughs> Whoa. I know. So color, this is almondine red. Now the reason that we did go so far to buy this one is because it's exactly what I've been looking for in a Mercedes for the past four or five years. I previously had a 124 in this color, which Connor now currently owns. Yeah. Good, good daily driver that, is it? Was. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I always said if that was a mistake, and a diesel, and had a cream leather interior, I wouldn't have sold it. And now I've got a cream leather interior diesel. Leather eye. Is it leather? Uh, right, okay. It's called the MB Tex, which is Mercedes's fancy version of leather, which has been around since the 50s. It's Mercedes' fancy version of vinyl. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Does it play music? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's Mercedes's fancier version of leather. It's more durable, and to be fair, given the condition of it right now, I'm not really surprised. It stands up to the people, test of time. People want MB tax more than leather. And that sounds like somebody who has an MB tax, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Our people want them, so they do. I have one of them, you know. <laughs> but genuinely, people do want MB tax. Yeah, they were, it was an optional extra and an expensive one at that too. But anyway, so the color. 
The color is Almondine Red and the color code is 512. And I, I just absolutely love it. There's something so regal about the pinky wine red that it is. It's, uh, it's just right Yeah. to me. Uh, now, uh, the paintwork's not amazing. I, I'll say that right now, but for a daily driver, it's perfect. Looks good in photos. Bit iffy up close, but I don't really care because it's going to be covered in dirt 90% of the year. There is one issue with it I don't really like. Somebody has tried to facelift it, kind of. The bumper here, this is meant to be black. Somebody's painted it and... It, uh, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't suit it, I think. Uh, if it was in great shape, maybe it would suit it. Yeah, but I like I still, the contrast. It needs the black to break it up a bit, I yeah. think. And I will be getting that sorted at some point because they're not in great shape, those bumpers but you can buy the inserts for them for like 30, 40 quid each front and back. So I might as well just buy them and be done with it. Yeah. So that'll be happening. Uh, another thing I don't like, I don't know why somebody's done it and I didn't actually realize until Connor pointed it out to me because that's just the type he is. He will point out something that will annoy you till the day you die. What is it? The star. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a facelift star. Yeah, the star is off a of facelift, which means it says Mercedes Benz here twice. Yeah. And it shouldn't. So I'll have to get one of them. They're also cheap. So let's have a quick look at that Majestic OM603 and I think for a vehicle with 283, soon to be 284, thousand miles on it, you will agree that this engine bay actually looks really good. Basically. Stop showing them the star. The three-pointed. Now is that not the cleanest? That's an engine. OM603 engine. In fact, any diesel engine at all, is that not the cleanest you have ever seen? This engine bay is missing something. What's it missing? If you say turbo, I swear to God. <laughs> it's missing an SLS reservoir. Okay, I'm gonna stand next to this warm engine because it's warm, freezing it? cold right now. It's and the then, middle of November. Then we'll talk about a uh, self-leveling suspension. <laughs> That's really lovely. That, that is nice. actually really nice and warm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try this at home in case your engine's really, really hot. <laughs> okay, so basically there's this thing on Mercedes Estates called self-leveling suspension. We've already talked about it in our Christmas special from roughly this time last year <laughs> when I bought the green W211. Which also doesn't have SLS when it should. Yes. Basically, uh, science happens and there's like airbags in the back that work as shocks, similar to your modern day airbag setups. And this has had them deleted, which is great to me, not to Connor. He gets very angry about this sort of thing. Upsets me greatly, yeah. To the point where uh, me and Doyle were talking and uh, Doyle actually thought you were angry at him. Did I? Did he? Because of how you were talking about the self-leveling. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you were so passionately angry about the fact that somebody had removed the self-leveling suspension when you were talking about it in our chat. <laughs> that Doyle messaged me privately and said, is he angry with me? <laughs> Genuinely. Uh, yeah, let's say yes. We didn't, we, we didn't, didn't guess. We didn't tell you that, like, but you genuinely thought you were upset with him. Like, <laughs> you're just so passionate about hating self-leveling suspension. Or hating, hating it, being it being removed. Deleted, yeah. But anyway, yeah, the person who removed it in this was, needless to say, pretty dumb. They went and got shocks for it that were way too big. I mean, to the point where this thing had no suspension on the back and you were going down the road like this and if you looked out the wrong way, you'd have an organism. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, so we had to do away with that. So after a little bit of research, we found out, and by we, I mean me, uh, found out that the shocks from a Ford Ranger pickup, Mark I, will fit into the back and today, this morning, after a lot of dicking about, we proved that theory to be correct and it's so much comfier now. I don't know if we mentioned it in the video of driving home. We'll figure that out. Because we've recorded this two weeks later, but in case we didn't mention it, uh, it was really uncomfortable. So now it's all sorted. I'm sure there's probably a more in-depth write-up on that somewhere. <laughs> but for now, all you need to know is I fixed it. Screw you, Connor. Self-leveling suspension is for nerds. Fair enough. I'm going to annoy so many Mercedes people. <laughs> yeah, starting with me. Now you've got Mercedes mad as man. <laughs> so, the interior. This is the MB text that we talked about. Um, as you can see, it's in remarkable condition. Like, this stuff really is stupidly durable. It's a wee bit stained still. I've given it a clean. Like, the dash and all is still immaculate. Uh, but the carpet has some, like, grubbiness. And it's basically just what happens when you buy a cream interior. It's just, it's the 
cross you bear, I guess, is that you just put up with the fact that yeah. it's going to get dirty just by looking at it. So uh, the plan, hear me out, the plan for this, and purists are going to hate this as well, but I don't care because it's an everyday car and it's also mine, not yours. Fair enough, yeah. It's my name in the textbook, for once. <laughs> <laughs> So the plan, I'm going to 3D print some kind of removable before you all start, some kind of a iPad mini mount, because I use the iPad mini for everything, and as I'll be dealing this a lot, I will want my infotainment set up, no matter what anyone says. The radio on these is really inset at the bottom, and that makes it ridiculously hard to put in the likes of a double din or a flip radio. Or they, they head you off with that. Mercedes were like, that cunt's going to try that in fucking 30 years. <laughs> make sure you make that good and deep. I'll do it again. <laughs> so the plan is to 3D print some kind of removable iPod mount here, which won't be unlike the type of touchscreen setup you get in most modern cars anyway. Because as far as I'm concerned, this is a lot of dead space here. There's nothing going on there, so I don't mind blocking it with a screen. Hmm. <laughs> for my sat nav and for my music. So that's happening there. Then the head unit, I'll probably keep the same. Everything else, I'm going to leave much the same, to be quite honest, because it's a timeless design that has nothing wrong with it. Everything is in the perfect place, everything works nicely. The sunroof worked when we got it, and then scarily stopped working on the way to the boat. Thank God it wasn't raining. But thankfully now... Doesn't work anymore. But thankfully now... <laughs> I have fixed it. I, it was literally a case of the, the contacts on the end of the fuse. Look at that. The contacts on the end of the fuse were dicking about, so I put it onto the wire wheel on the bench, put it back in, and now it works swimmingly. And hopefully it keeps working because it's my favorite thing. I know they all had them, but they don't all work. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, JDM is fun. Hmm. Uh, Next up is at the back of the car. Now on the W123 wagons, they would have had roof mounted speakers, which yeah. I think is a brilliant idea. So my plan is to try and recreate that. Now I know there aren't the holes for them and it's gonna involve me drilling holes in my beautiful Amandine roof, which is a bit scary, I'll be honest. But I'm gonna mount two six by nines because it's the 90s, my dude. Oh yes. <laughs> gonna put two Alpine six by nines in the roof running to an amplifier and a subwoofer under the seats, coming into this head unit. So basically it's the first car that I've had that's quiet enough to warrant putting a good audio setup in and actually appreciate mm. the quality rather than just having to make it loud to be heard over an exhaust. So mm. I'm gonna go through the hassle over Christmas time when I'm off work to really upgrade the sound quality in this because this thing's gonna do a lot of driving. This is probably gonna be my main daily now because I don't want to drive anything else because it's so nice. Mm, um, yeah, pretty much. So when you wanted something for a long, long time, it, I've never been like this before where I've wanted something for ages, finally got one and it was ready to go. Yeah. I've bought things that were what I've always wanted, but I've had to make them into what I always wanted or I've had to MOT them or spend a fortune getting them ready. This one's on the road now, ready to be enjoyed. So I'm kind of just enjoying being able to drive it, to be honest. It's not a very common 427 trait <laughs> here to get a car that's on the road, ready to go. So no, sadly, I, I really, I, these videos are usually telling you what's wrong with something, but for once we actually don't really have anything wrong with it. It's refreshing, isn't it? Yeah. So this one, this video series will just be us kind of improving it and enjoying it and driving it which is so unheard of for us. So back here, being in a state, you know, it's, it's, it's got a boot. Um, <laughs> it's quite stiff to open, but I think I need to replace the shocks. Now, the annoying thing is uh, it doesn't have seven seats. Kind That's of sad. It is sad because I have actually used the seven seats in my green one. It's not like they don't, it's not like they're a pure novelty. I have actually practically used them. Yeah. So it's kind of annoying I don't have them, but what do you do? So the boot carpet is a bit grubby, so that's why I have the blanket over the top. Under here, you have space for tools. It's remarkably solid. Uh, I'm going to stone chip the whole thing probably and just keep it good. Yeah. That's definitely not a factory first aid kit. So it's that's not. probably going to go. That is a factory first aid kit, but shouldn't that be in here? Should. So should that warning triangle. Why Jack. is it all under here? Don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna probably put some tools and things just to have in the boot in here. Yeah. Just because they're handy. Uh, up here, which unfortunately I've been in far too much, 
is how you get to the fuel tank if you've uh, put the car back together properly when you last had it apart, which I haven't. Fair enough. Ugh. Lovely. Let's see. Let's, let's make a proper job of this, shall we? Oh, look at that. Lovely. Couldn't beat it. Like a golf. Yeah. That's your new shocky shock. That's my new shocks making interesting noises. Anyway. So here is how you get to the fuel tank, which is one job that I have unfortunately had to do because I got caught short one time. <laughs> the fuel gauge wasn't actually reading properly and it's to buy a new center unit is about £300 and frankly I wasn't going to pay that. So I took some pictures, but I have fixed it. You take off this big nut and it is massive. It's like a 42 or something like that. So yeah. if you do have to do this yourself, make sure you have the tool before you start it. And then you take it out and there was corrosion on the slider unit. Mm. And uh, I it's spat on it slide, and yeah. then it was fine. Nice. Uh, <laughs> no, I wire brushed it and my dad resoldered. There's a cable, there's like a very, very fine wire that works for the low fuel warning light and it was broken, the solder was broken and it come off. So with that all cleaned up and repaired, put it back in and now it reads perfectly. So I haven't been caught since, but that was a scary experience running out of diesel on the motorway. But it's one of those you can't know that it's not working unless you've owned the car for a while. True. You don't know what it should be at or what it shouldn't be at, so thankfully that's all sorted now and I don't know how to put this back on. Mm -hmm. Let's just assume that's it, shall we? Uh, yeah, so that's... Oh. Oh yeah. Ah! So we'll just cover this back over so it's a bit nicer looking still. And then up here, as per most Mercedes estates, we have the parcel shelf, which doesn't retract so well yeah it's okay but it does so and then we have the dog net for dogging for the dogs yeah hey uh, that's basically it back here when you don't have the seats it's a bit less interesting CT. yeah but anyway at long last after a huge trip my first time ever buying a car unseen in england which just it's all a terrifying experience thankfully it has turned out to be possibly the best purchase I've ever made. I think it's definitely the happiest I've been with a purchase like instantly in quite a long time. Like being able to just drive it straight away and enjoy it and have it be what I want. It's not something we're used to in this channel really. We're used to finding something cool, having to park it up for like a year until we can afford to fix it and then, yeah. then it never happens. So it's, it's, I know it's not your usual 427 viewing, but I think anybody who's into our channel can agree that this thing is super cool. So thank you very, very much for watching our adventure to the NEC in Birmingham and to rugby to buy this thing. Um, I'd like to give a huge thank you to the guys at Cosford Hall Classic Cars who kept it for us and sent us all the videos we needed and all the photos we needed and just were extremely helpful and nice and couldn't ask for better. So go and check out their Instagram. I'll put it down here below. Uh, another big thank you to the Mercedes-Benz Club of the UK for kind of taking me and Connor under their wing and flying us over to England land to look at some pretty cars and slag a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for that, this wouldn't be here. So a huge thank you to them. If you are interested in Mercedes and would like to be a member of the Owners Club, I've put the QR code at the side here and you can put your phone up to it and it'll bring you to the link and you can join the club that way. Uh, but for now, from me, Tamo, knowing me, Tamo, knowing you, Connor behind the camera. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, thank you very, very much everyone for watching. Uh, sorry this one took quite a while to get out. Um, don't know what we're going to be up to next, probably more polo stuff. Uh, we've got that push on before Christmas now to get some stuff done, so we should have plenty of com content coming your way. Uh, as ever, follow me on Instagram at tamo.patterson, follow Connor on Instagram at Hughes Corporation, and yeah, that's it basically. We'll see you in the next one. Good, Good luck. luck.